Thanks for joining. I'm here to talk about some of the power systems modeling and analysis capabilities that we've enabled at NREL through the Scalable Integrated Infrastructure Planning, or SIP, initiative. First off, I want to thank my team. Uh, Sarab, Deepak, Jose, and Dan, and several others have, have been uh, critical to, to making these packages a reality and enabling the, the great features that I'm going to show off today. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is, is that it's hard to understand, understate the, the contribution of map power. Um, map power came about many years ago and the, the run PF function in map power really is quite powerful in that it, it uh, without any arguments, uh, selects a, a default case file, builds a model, runs some calculations, and presents results to the user. I think that that is incredibly powerful in that it presents a gateway where the user can then go inspect the open source code behind MapPower, understand what's happening because it's it's transparent and easy to follow, and then go potentially extend it and customize it and, and do what they want with it. I think, um, I think that many uh, students and, and researchers and Analysts and engineers have, have learned a lot from the, the, map, the map power package, and we wanted to enable some of those features for a broader set of modeling activities. Uh, modeling activities like, like the one that is showcased here as, as part of the NARIS study, the North American Renew Renewable Integration Study. Um, so NARIS is really aimed at looking at what the, the a potential power system might look like in North America under different scenarios of uh, increased interconnection between the countries um, and, and how that system might achieve various decarbonization and uh, renewable energy goals over the next uh, 20 to 30 years. And so the, the core modeling capability behind this study is a production cost model. And that, that's effectively looking at how does the power system get scheduled to meet uh, energy demands. And, and uh, that scheduling occurs at the, at sort of a, a day, you know, the core scheduling problems occur at the day ahead and then a uh, shorter sort of hour ahead uh, uh, time scale. And so that, so we'll enable some similar uh, production cost modeling activities in this demonstration using a slightly smaller test system that you can download called the reliability test system. And we'll do that with some of the packages that we've enabled to do to enable production cost modeling in Julia, including powersystems.jl and powersimulation.jl. These really encompass the core of the capabilities that we've enabled on the SIP initiative. Uh, we have a few others that include power simulations dynamics that look at transient stability analysis um, and a, a, a number of others on, on supporting these core capabilities with graphics and, and, and data sets and things like that. But the, the core packages that I want to cover are powersystems.jl, which is really a data model and a data handling utility, as well as powersimulations.jl, which is where all the modeling happens, and it's squarely focused on uh, quasi-static optimization problems, looking at how do you schedule the, or how do you enable optimization problems in power systems, and then a simulation utility where how do you step between optimization problems and enable, enable a simulation like a production cost model to simulate the operations of a system over the course of some longer time. So today I'll be I'll be focused on power systems and simulations. Uh, here's the environment I'm using. As you can see, it includes some plotting utilities with Plotly.js and Power Graphics, which really helps translate power simulation results into into some graphical representations, as well as a, a solver capability with Express, which is a commercial optimization solver. Uh, you can use open source solvers too, but 
um, it, at, with anything at decently large scale on the problem size, uh, the commercial solvers are quite helpful. So let's start with a tour of power systems, some of the features and some of the capabilities that we've enabled. So first of all, everybody who encounter who wants to start with power systems modeling needs to start with some data. Um, and we've enabled some parsers to, to read some of the most standard data files that are out there. So, uh, that, and that is with map power and PTI, those are some of the most standard data files. We've also enabled a CSV parser that's quite configurable so, that, so as to minimize the amount of formatting you need to do on your CSV data. Um, so starting with a, a, you know, a, a map power case file, you can point power systems at that and create a system. Um, and, and it reads that map power file and, and instantiates a number of structs to populate that system. We've also got uh, a, an auxiliary library called powersystemcasebuilder.jl, which is really a utility to manage a library system, knowing, recognizing that modelers would likely have many systems that they would be using and and managing those is, is somewhat challenging. And so we can we we can enable that with Power Systems Case Builder and we we've populated that with a number of the this uh, systems that we use in our continuous integration tests as well as some of the standard actually test systems and some of the larger scale systems enabled from Texas A. You could also populate it with some of your own local systems if you wanted. So for this demonstration, we're going to focus on a day ahead and real time energy or electricity market simulation using the RTS GMLC system. And so using some of the systems that are in the power system case builder, we'll start with a, a day ahead system and then we'll also build a, a real time system. And these are pre-populated with time series data to represent wind, solar, load, and hydropower time series. And the reason that they're distinct is because that time series for the day ahead system is, is in hourly resolution, whereas the time series in the real time system is in five minute resolution. And we made that distinction so, as, so that we can keep the time series consistent within a single system. A system itself is really just a collection of components. And this is where we've created a type hierarchy and power, power systems to support uh, a variety of different components. Um, components that fall in the device abs fall as subtypes of the device abstract type are to represent physical infrastructure. These are buses, generators, lines, things like that. Services are things like reserves that are that denote system requirements, and topology are just abstract graph theoretic no notation such as arcs and, and nodes. Uh, devices are um, organized according to operational similarity. So these, these physical infrastructure pieces operate in the real world and they're organized to, to represent similarities. So generators are all injection devices and they you know, are generally uh, you know, flowing power onto the grid. And um, and then we've got three different subtypes of generator, like hydro generators, uh, renewable generators, and thermal generators, and then different concrete types of each of those to represent different uh, data characteristics of each type. And this allows us to take advantage of, of Julia's multiple dispatch in the model. Additionally, we've relied on another package called infrastructure system.jl that we built specifically to enable this type hierarchy and support the the retrieval of data from a system and things like that um, and we recognize that this could be useful for things beyond just power systems and we we have some examples with with uh, water systems and we're also uh, thinking about other things like hydrogen systems and other uh, infrastructure systems uh, implementations infrastructure systems.jl also uh, allows is where we specify the API. We've enabled um, a lot of logging routines and recorders that, that span across powersystems.jl, powersimulations.jl, and powersimulations.dynamics. Um, and then we've enabled some efficient time series access and, data and storage to, to support 
what can be quite large, uh, large data sets at times. Um, one other feature that I want to highlight is that all of this type hierarchy and the, the definitions of the concrete, uh, the concrete type or the structs that are the concrete types is all auto-generated through a specification, a JSON specification, and then the auto-generation code lives in infrastructure systems.jl. This is really useful for uh, code maintenance um, and and any um, you know changes that need to propagate to all of the, the different devices or services or things like that. So uh, once you have a system, we can access those components using the uh, the API of get components, which retrieves an iterator, and that iterator will retrieve um, uh, uh, will it will enable the iteration over all of the components that are a subtype of the the first argument here, and so you can see that this particular system has 64 thermal generators and. 19 hydro energy reservoir generators and things like that. So this is pretty powerful and is kind of the, the fundamental building block for modeling since you will apply a common constraint over, over certain types, but probably not the concrete type, probably some abstract type of, above the concrete type. And then once you have a component, you might want to get the data associated with a, a specific component. We've enabled an API that uh, that enables access to all of the the component fields with getter functions. So the 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 auto generation code pre-populates all of these getter functions and creates uh, functions like get name, get angle, and things like that. Since bus has a, a field of name and angle and things like that. Of course, you can use the dot notation in Julia to to access these things, but we highly discourage that. And we do that for a couple of reasons. First, the getter functions allow us an opportunity to, to change the behavior of the, the, the accessor so that we can maintain backwards compatibility and not introduce baking changes, even though we may rename some of the fields in the struct or, or change the structure uh, somehow. Um, additionally, we, through the getter functions, we have the opportunity to interrupt the data that's uh, coming back to support some per unit transformations. So all of the data stored, in most cases, the data stored in the component structs is in the system per unit base. And, and that, uh, if you're familiar with power systems modeling, can create all sorts of confusion for even the most seasoned modelers. And so we have enabled a, a per unit setting that is a system-wide property where it can take on the form of natural units, um, system base or device base. And those per unit transformations happen when you're retrieving values through the get uh, or the getter functions as we call them. And so that, that's a really nice feature that we, uh, we really encourage that people use the getter functions rather than the dot access. So each component can also contain uh, time series data, or at least any device or service component can contain device uh, time series data. Uh, time series data can take on the, uh, can describe any field, and so it can actually be a scaling factor and reference any field within the struct so that when you actually get the time series data back, it will be multiplied by that field and, and scaled accordingly. Um, or it can just be an arbitrary set of values. Additionally, time series can represent both forecast data and um, a contiguous or actual time series. Um, and this is useful so that we can understand how the uh, uh, uncertainty of of forecasted information can affect the power system scheduling uh, practices. And so to do this, we've enabled a few different time series types, both single times or static time series, which are really the, the, the single contiguous time series where there's a unique set of timestamps, and then a, a forecast data where, where forecast windows can really overlap in their representation of specific time periods, like the 
orange and the blue uh, windows here. And additionally, we've enabled um, various conversions between the two, so recognizing that many modeling data sets will only contain a static time series or a single time series, and then we, but we want to uh, represent it like a forecast for a production cost model or other activities. So time series data access really requires the reference of the the generator and a, since a generator can contain multiple time series, we need some identifiers on exactly which time series we're, we're looking at. For example, this particular hydro generator uh, contains three different time series in this um, in this model or in this data set. And then, if we want to just get the max active power time series, we can do so with the get time series array function function and it returns a, a time array. The, another nice feature that recognizing that, that these, the, these, in, these power systems data sets can get quite large, we've really spent a, a significant amount of effort in optimizing the storage of the time series data. So uh, by default, we use an HDF5 file to store time series. You can't avoid that for small data sets um, and just load the entire thing in memory, but, but by default, we use an HDF5 that's been optimized for execution time access. We've, we do these batch prefetching uh, of data so that we can avoid uh, frequent or too frequent uh, uh, IO requests to the H5, which can really slow things down. And then we've also enabled some op optional uh, compression options to, to minimize the storage for footprint. We've hit some data sets that are quite large and, and these, some of these features have really, really helped with the performance of things. Additionally, um, for, for loads and some renewable devices, we recognize that some of them are subject to the same time series. And so as to not duplicate that data, we're, we allow for multiple components to reference the same data. Other features of power systems include uh, standard network matrix calculations like PTDFs or YBUS. Um, and we also have some basic power flow capability and calculation capabilities where we can solve a, a basic newton raphson power flow. Um, these, it's worth noting that this power flow is not really suitable for contingency analysis because we're not really trying to represent system limits or adjust any of the control settings like the PV and PQ. Um, it, we we are working on actively working on some capabilities to extend that to 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 make a more uh, contingency analysis appropriate power flow as well. And finally, once you have a, a system that you're happy with you, the, and you you can and you want to use for modeling, we found that it's very useful to be able to store it in a native format that's really intended just for serialization and deserialization. So we have these basic serialization and deserialization routines that uh, ensure that you, you're getting back the exact same data and you don't have to go through the sometimes more taxing uh, parsing process to create your data set. Okay, so now that we've done a quick tour of power systems, going through power simulations, uh, we want to cover some of the capabilities here. So power simulations can enable a bunch of different optimization problems, including unit commitment, economic dispatch, optimal power flow, uh, include, and also AGC and ACE calculations. But one of the more powerful things is that we can also enable a simulation, which really is, it, it is multiple optimization problems and, and with a specified information flow between them. And so we can specify the, the formulation, uh, how, how large of a uh, time horizon you're covering, and, you, and how the initial conditions and the parameters are updated. And we do that, uh, so starting with the formulation, the, the way that we specify a formulation is with what we call a template. And we use, uh, we create a template, and on the left here we'll create a unit commitment template. And to do that, we for each category of device, like lines, we apply a formulation, which is just an abstract type that 
that helps the, the multiple dispatch navigate the code and apply the correct uh, variables and constraints to, to each device. So it basically calls the get components on all the lines and then applies the correct uh, constraint creation and, and variable creation according to this static branch formulation type. And so uh, you can do that for all the different categories of devices in the system. And then, uh, and then finally, you can set the transmission model. In this, in this case, I'm going to use a DCP power model, which is actually a type defined by powermodels.jl. And this is really a testament to the modularity capabilities of Julia in our, and we will actually be using power models. Uh, calling power models code to populate the jump model with the data that we've stored in power systems. And so we do that for the day ahead template and then we can also do the same thing for the economic dispatch template or the real-time template. The only difference here being that the, uh, uh, the thermal units are using a dispatch formulation rather than the incremental formulation. Um, So then once we've done that, we can also define uh, the, the problems in the simulation. And so we use the template and then the system to define two different problems. So we've got a unit commitment and an economic dispatch problem. In this case, we've also defined some slack variables in the economic dispatch problem just to help with feasibility on some harder problems. Um, and then finally, we can also define the, the way that information flows between those problems and between uh, different steps of those problems. And so we call this a sequence. And the sequence really takes that, that list of problems and then it defines a few things. So first it defines how, um, how, how, how big are each step. So there's the horizon of the problem and in the in the unit commitment case, we have a 48 hour problem, but each time we solve that problem, we want to step forward 24 hours. And that's this interval uh, calculation here. And we want to do that in a consecutive fashion. We have other options like receding horizon and things like that. Um, similarly, with the economic dispatch, we want to solve a 15 minute problem. Or, sorry, we want to solve one hour problem stepping forward 15 minutes each time. And then, um, and then we want the initial conditions to flow uh, in between problems of the same, uh, in between the executions of the same problem. And then uh, we also want to be able to synchronize between unit commitment and that government dispatch so that we take the commitment values and, and use them to inform the dispatch problem so that we're, we're actually dispatching the units that have been committed in the day ahead. Um, and that's all defined with the feed forward and the feed forward technologies. Ultimately, we get a little ASCII art to return so that you can kind of verify that we're doing what we want, solve one unit commitment problem, and then 24 economic dispatch problems. Um, and uh, yeah. Then we can, uh, then we can define the, the overall simulation and build the simulation. And this is where the jump model is actually created. And we'll watch it put together. And so the first thing it does is goes through and builds the network um, and it uses power, it calls power models to build the network that we've specified. And then it goes through and hangs the, the injector, injector devices off of that network and calls the unit commitment constraints or whatever network form or uh, formulations you want to apply to the devices. And so it built and then we can execute the simulation. And this is where we'll go through and solve each optimization problem and update each problem with parameter jump and some of the other capabilities. And so we, we've optimized things as best we can to only ever update the right-hand side of the problem. That way we never, never have to reconstruct the entire problem just at the beginning. And we can update the right-hand side with new data to represent new time series and things like that. And then we've got a little progress bar. We're only solving two days worth of this problem. So that's that's two 48 hour problems with a bunch of five minute uh, or 15 minute um, uh, economic dispatch problems in between. 
Uh, it should take about 20 seconds or so to, to finish this. And then we will be able to get results. Yeah, and then we get a nice little summary to, to learn where, where it spent most of its time, um, things like that. More detailed logs are available with some query functions enabled by infrastructure systems so that you can you know, graphically represent the solve time and, and, things, and profile things a little better. Like that. So now that we've got problems and results, we can look at some of the capabilities uh, we can look at some of those results with some analytic capabilities. Uh, we can read the variables themselves. This is going to look at uh, each window of variables. So these are going to be 48, uh, 48 length. Each uh, result will be length 48. Um, and and uh, and then uh, and then, but there, there's only tw 24 of them is going to be the ones that you want to keep, whereas the other is kind of a look ahead period. The other 24 are a look ahead period. The realized variables will kind of take care of that for you and throw away the, the look ahead and only take the, the periods that are, uh, you know, non-recourse periods. Um, and then finally, you can we have some basic plotting capabilities in Power Graphics. Uh, in this case, we'll do a dispatch stack, looking at um, uh, dispatch by generator type, um, and then you could you could do this by uh, individual generators or whatever you want. So integrated with plots.jl as well as plotlyjs.jl to create some interactivity. You can toggle things on and off to look at. Um, how how well things are operating. Um, yeah, so what we've done here is we've created a a production cost modeling capability. It really goes quite a bit beyond that. We've got capabilities around AC optimal power flow by by integrating with power models and and AGC and a number of other things and We've really been happy with the modularity of Julia to enable some of these approaches. Um, and I just can't imagine trying to do this within GANs or, or some other ecosystem that uh, just does not feature that same set of mod modularity. Um, we've also been really happy with the ability to create a, a, a modeling and analysis ecosystem that exists within a common language so that you're not writing, uh, you're not always writing files to disk and you can really reduce that development time of, of kind of creating models and, and getting feedback on what the results look like. And ultimately we think that we've, we, we've proven the, the, the value of, of SIP and the value of this development through creating uh, tools that are fast enough and scalable enough to enable uh, future studies like Neris, um, while it's also flexible enough to support, you know, the exploration of some new technology or some new modeling approach. And then we're really happy with this extensibility to be able to support algorithm developments. Like how can you create a, a faster routine to solve a unit problem, things like that. And we've got some various activities in that space that that are, are, are really coming along. And SIP has really provided us an opportunity where all the people working on these different aspects can work on a common language so that the best available techniques are available to the analysts and the best data sets are available to the algorithmic developers and so on and so forth. Um, here's a list of our packages and we have uh, a number of activities ongoing. You know, some of the key things that we're working on is, is connecting the contingency analysis and stability analysis capabilities with these production costs and quasi-static optimization capabilities. And I think that's going to make some really powerful capabilities for analyzing systems in the future. Uh, with that, thank you very much. And we can uh, take questions.